So to move to this teaching is extremely important. We are live now. So uh, just go to a far distance a little bit. So we can check if it's your claim, the sound is clean. Hallelujah. Amen. Recognizing and avoiding dead choices. <laughs> As to this teaching, we'll be looking at um, the God that raises the dead. So today is the part three. And today's teaching is going to be very, 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 very uh, deep, like the others have been as well, very powerful as well. Recognizing and avoiding dead churches. Recognizing and avoiding dead churches. So our anchor scripture is going to be taken from Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. This is a very important scripture. Jesus himself uh, said those words. So let's read Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, This thing says he who has, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Jesus said, you have a name that you're alive and that you are dead. So the church of God globally now is going through a very significant phase. The man child is about to be born. In other words, Jesus is going to come. Uh, the rapture is going to happen. But before the man child is born, just like a woman that is at the verge of giving birth, there will be contra contractions, there will be pain, there will be struggles. Some of these pains and these struggles are reflected in what I call the rising of dead churches. There are many living churches on earth, but we also have many dead churches. When I say dead churches, I'm not speaking about physically dead people now. People are congregating, people are walking about, people are singing praise worship, but the church is dead. As far as ever is concerned, it's a dead church. And you can have 100,000 people in that church or 10 people in that church. The number is not the issue now. The issue is that the church is dead. The church is dead. So, and we, I don't want to belabor you this morning. We all are students of the world. Gathering together as believers is a biblical induction, not religion. Anytime you hear the word, I hate religion. I hate religion. We all know that Christianity is not a religion. We know. But anytime you see people emphasize it, it's because they don't want instruction. They want to be rebellious. They want to be called a child of God. They also want to go to club. So they will tell you, I hate religion. There are many of them on social media. They don't want their pastor to correct them. They want to mismanage their marriage. They want to be married to a woman and to have girlfriends. I will say, I hate religion. Religion will tell me what to do. No. I want to live my life the way you can't live your life the way you like. You don't hold yourself. Apostle Paul was speaking to Corinthians and said, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. You are not your own. You don't own yourself. And I've emphasized this thing over and over again. The current generation needs to be told the truth. They don't want to hear it, but they hear it by force. That is why we use all manners of platforms now. To share the word, they are on TikTok. We take the word to them on TikTok. Three minutes, four minutes. Their attention span is very small, so they can't wait and sit down and listen to you one of us. So we cut it down for four minutes, three, three minutes. We do we use Facebook Reel, we use all manners of so as to get the word so that no man will be without excuse before God that I did not hear. You need to come together to fellowship with other believers in a church community. You cannot develop alone. Spiritual development is not built on isolation. You cannot do it. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, let's look at this scripture. You can grow in an environment of isolation. You need other people, particularly other believers. Satan is the one deceiving people, telling them you can grow alone. You can't grow alone. There is a time for personal development. There is a place for personal devotion, but you need to be in the company of other believers. You know what that does to you? 
so that they can put you on check. So you won't come out and say, I, I have a voice. The voice is telling me, so, somebody beside will tell you, no, my brother, you are wrong. It is for checks and balances. Acts 242 says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. They continue, they, they, they continue. Speaking of a community of believers. Number two, Act 244. Act 244. Now, all who believed were together and had all things. we all know that we all use that pastors have used all over the world to encourage people to go to church is hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 hebrews 10 25 says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some but exalting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching don't forsake the assembly of yourself we have to come together as a church. A church is a community of at least two people, two believers, two believers. It's ecclesia in Greek language, which means they called out once. You cannot become an effective, mature believer in isolation. 90% or 70% or 80% of most of the things I know and that God has taught me, God taught me using many many other people many people many leaders many pastors many i read their books i attend their meetings i congregate i attend conferences i attend conventions because no man is an island you cannot the chances of being derailed are 99 or 9 percent if you are in isolation if you are an isolated christian isolation is one of the weapons of the devil to mislead the church in these last days you don't know everything. Nobody is an island of knowledge. Nobody is an island of knowledge. You need other people. So having said that, we should also understand that we are in what is called a post-Christian culture. What does that mean? In the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, the perception of the society, of the larger society to the church, is totally different from their perception today. People still respected the marriage institution. People that have something else in their heart that they want to do, they won't come to the public and tell you they want to marry a man, a man. They won't do it publicly. People will do it privately. The audacity to confront the Bible and say the Bible is wrong, you can't find that, that in the 60s, 70s, 80s. But because of the forces of the last days, the rising of demonic powers, the, the prophetic calendar of the world that Jesus gave us in Matthew 24, a lot of things are happening now. The man child will soon be born. So because of that, we are in a post-Christian culture. The church is being attacked, but the Bible is not being believed by many people. Satan is the one at the back of his thing. Because of that, because of that, you and I must be very careful. The kind of places we go to that we call a church. Not everywhere people gather and say, in the name of Jesus, is a church. That people are praying and fasting does not mean they are doing it in a church. And I'm going to give you some samples and some signs of what you need to know, you need to be careful of to identify what is a living church and which is a dead church? Hallelujah. Amen. So we're in the last days. And Jesus has done a lot of great work for us in helping us identify what is a dead church. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus appeared and was speaking and was talking to John on the island of Patmos. And Jesus gave John certain instructions, certain words. 
I'm going to pick on those words this morning. I read the scripture as we began this morning. Let's go to Revelation 3 verse 1. Revelations chapter 3 verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis. So there's a church in Sardis. This church of Sardis. Right. This thing says he who has, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. That you have a name that you are alive. But you are dead. When God says something is dead, it means he's dead. When God says something is dead, it means it is dead. <clears throat> Remember in Genesis 2 verse 17, God spoke to Adam. God said, the day you eat of the fruit, this fruit, you will die. No, Adam thought it was physical death, but God was speaking about spiritual death. So God's definition of death supersedes man's definition of death. God sees into eternity. So when Jesus looked at the church inside, he said, this church, you are dead. Why did Jesus call it dead? But before we go there, there was something Jesus said. He said, you have a good reputation. God's people. This church was a reputable church in the society. House of Jeremiah International Christian Center. Beautifully packaged, nice auditorium with air conditioning systems, with all manners of gadgets, which is very good. Nothing is wrong with that. Jesus said, You have reputation, but you are dead. The question this one is it, is it possible to combine reputation with spiritual death? Yes. A church can be reputable, but in the eyes of God, it is dead, which is what we have seen, and we keep seeing. All over the world. What is a church that has a reputation? What does it look like? So let's do, let me give you eight signs of a reputable church. Reputable church. So a church has a good reputation. Reputation stands for respect. Respectable church. A church in the eyes of man has a good reputation. If the church has existed for many years. Oh, this church has existed for 70 years, for 30 years. So, in the mind of a man, if it has stayed that long, it means it's a good church. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Longevity is not predictive of divine approval. Longevity is not predictive of divine approval. There are many satanic churches that are 120 years old in America. <laughs> All over the world. So you don't make a choice of a church on the basis of it has been there for 40 years. Something can start today and God can be there. It's also possible for something to start today and God is not there. So the matter of choosing a church has nothing to do with longevity. Number two, the church is rich. This one is common, very popular. Many rich people attend the church. Nothing is wrong in having billionaires in the church. Nothing is wrong in having wealthy people in the church. That is not the focus this morning. But that is not the primary driver for choosing the church you should belong to. Financial prosperity does not come alone from God. Satan prospers people financially. Many of the things that God does on earth, I'm choosing my words, many of the things that God does on earth, Satan can counterfeit them, can do them. God give Architectural edifice. That one is also a very major one. Very beautiful cathedral. Nice cathedral. There is nothing wrong with nice cathedral. We want nice cathedral too. Beautiful place. Comfortable place. But that is not the condition. We have cases where people actually collect money from so many places to build cathedral. 
few years ago, a man of God was telling me something very scary. I won't mention the country, mention the name, <laughs> so you can't even determine the person I'm talking about. So he went to a place and he saw a man. And the man said, Do you want to build a big church? He said, We will fund churches. And he began to mention big, big churches in that country. He said, We we'll fund churches. He said, But you will be our front, our face. We we'll build for you. Let me tell you, within three, four months, because you are, you are now the biggest in the town. Everybody will move to your church and then you can have an, an, an arrangement. Type an offering, we share it, 70 30. The man told me himself, I didn't read in a paper. He said, That's why you, I can't believe my ears. I ran for my life. He said, They have been calling me. He said, How much do you want? 20 billion? 10 billion? He said, How much do you want? In, in, they were not mentioning names. This, 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 we, we bankrolled that project. But nobody will know. And the person who got the altar, the Lord said to me, the Lord gave me the money. <laughs> so you want to choose a church, you don't say, oh, because of the cathedral. That is where God is. You could be wrong. There is nothing wrong in having a great cathedral. But I'm saying that is not the basic. That is not the most important thing. Because you can get it wrong. Another quality or attribute of a reputable church. Don't forget, Jesus looked at the church inside this. Say, you are a reputable church, but you are dead. How can Jesus call? How can you marry reputation and death? Oh, it's possible. It means you can be reputable, but you are dead. So we are looking at the first eight. There are many other factors. The church is involved with charitable activities. When you do charity, men will love you. Oh, they are feeding the poor. Is it not good to feed the poor? I, I pray that God will raise more churches that will feed the poor. Is it not good that we should buy clothes and buy houses and build houses? These are great things that God wants us to do for the society to shine our light. But that is not the basis for choosing your church. A lot of the... <laughs> there are many criminals in this world. Some of the most terrible human beings in this world are the kindest. Because they launder their image using charity. And if you want to choose where you will place your head as a church, you are looking for charity, you will make a big mistake. Giving to the poor is good. But that is not the basis for knowing where you go. The Bible did not say, by their charity, you shall know them. Scripture says, by their fruits, you shall know them. There's something happened recently <laughs> in Nigeria, and you see people hanging back and forth about how oh, he's a man of God, not a man of God. Why is he a man of God? Because he gives to the poor. I said, What are you talking about? People who are in the open, they do charity, they tell them the money you have must not sleep with you that day, you must give it out. Many of them have agents that serve food, serve clothes, and so when you are a casual Christian. When you are a flat, casual, you, 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 you are not deep. These things will trip you. You won't be able to look at the real issue. What are the fruits of this church? How are their pastors? What is their message? Before you put your head in that particular church, which explains the reason why the devil is attacking discipleship. How many pastors in a year teach on discipleship in their church? Amen. Once you begin to teach about those things, it will unsettle people who are corrupt, who are making money, and they will go. Because your budget in the church every year is 50 billion, and you have projects that you want to do. You don't want 50 billion to become 5 billion. So you avoid those teachings. You talk about motivation, success, prosperity. Nothing is wrong with those things. But those are not the real things, the real food that builds stamina in people to withstand temptation, to withstand crisis of life. Discipleship is paramount and primary. So the devil attacks discipleship so that believers will not know how to differentiate between good and evil. So about two years ago, someone asked me, say, Pastor Ayo, You've been teaching about how to know the a good. I mean, I wrote an article in the newspaper, a very powerful article about this kind of thing I'm talking about. So this guy came to me, 
He mentioned his church, a very popular church in Nigeria. He said, Is my church a bad church? Am I the one who determine whether a church is bad or not? I'm not what, what is my I am a minister, I just teach the truth. I said, if you have been born again for 10 years, you cannot know the difference between good and evil. Ah, something was wrong with your faith. You will know. The Bible says the spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the source of God. If you are in an environment where things are done well and you are a student of the world, you will know that this man is very proud. So I now say, let me help you. Give him some signs. So anyway, you see these things. You see these things. You see these things. You see these things. Then be very careful. They go and pray. Because people are very funny. The next thing you will hear is, Pastor, you told me that my church is back. <laughs> I will copy your message and post it on social media. I said, no. Go and make up your mind. Wherever God wants you to go, go. Number five. When a church is called reputable in the 21st century, what does it mean? The church has many branches around the world. Many branches around the world. That is irrelevant. How many apostles turn the world upside down? Twelve. How many apostles turn the world upside down? Twelve. <laughs> Quality trumps quantity in the kingdom of God. Quantity is good, but not when quality is compromised. You don't need volume to change the world. You only need value. Gospel. You don't need volume to change the world. You only need value. So having one billion Christians who carry no power, carry no supernatural energy, carry no grace, what can see is useless. Having one thousand firebrand, tongue talking, faithful, God fearing Joseph and Daniels can wrap to the whole world. To so Dr. Tony Evans, who gave this analogy. The planning of the 9 11 attack in the US was done by 21 people. 21. Dr. Evans said, if 21 people that were motivated by a satanic theology, if they could come together and unite to bring down the most powerful economy in the world, he said, what will 2.5 billion Christians do if we are serious? But we are not serious. We are not serious. We make choices of churches based on reputation. And Jesus looked at the saddest church. Say, you are reputable, but you are dead. If by being reputable, you automatically become a living church. Jesus would have said, you are reputable and you are alive. He said, you are reputable and dead. So the church has branches all over the world. It's not the basis for choosing where you will go. God is the one that chooses pastors. I'll get that shortly. Whether it's a church of 100 million people or 100 people, it's irrelevant. As long as God is leading you there and their lifestyles and their values align with the values of God. Number six, what is a reputable church? The church is connected to high profile people in the society. You know, our pastor is a friend to the president. You know, the governor is a son to daddy. These are irrelevant, man-made, nonsensical attributes. These things bear no resemblance with transformational ability of Christ. That I am connected to the U.S. president. What does that have to do with the source of men? What is the impact? Does this lead to the salvation of souls? Does this lead to the, to the remediation of marital crisis? How many marriages have my, as my relationship? With the president of America, Mende. These are human metrics for branding. It's just a branding strategy. I will take big picture, do photo ops with the president, put it on my Facebook page. There is one guy in South Africa who is a scammer. Before they knew there was a scammer, the guy will be taking pictures. Know what he does? This guy takes pictures with celebrities. Ah, this guy is a good. He takes picture with celebrities. Sankan president, Oprah Winfrey, just somebody went to school. The only thing he knows how to do is to take pictures. He doesn't do any work. The work he does is coming. He will now put the picture of the president as his DP. 
So you will not start selling something. If you come to your inbox, I have a project somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. The guy came to my inbox. When I saw the picture, I clicked on the profile. I saw him flanked by the president. I said, well, you know, it was time to be humble, you know. God has blessed me. I have contacts of all these people and whatever. What was he trying to do? To add credibility to his car. And based on what I had, the man scammed so many people. If you see me taking pictures with Joe Biden, and I'm telling you, I'm a real estate consultant. Will you doubt me? Ah, for this man to have access to White House. So the man swindled a lot of women. Because that is human method. When you look at branding, you know, I said something last Sunday. <laughs> the values of Christ are diametrically opposed to the values of this world. In the world, branding, pushing your people above others, showing your results, flashing your success, that is what sells. In the Christian faith, it is opposite. You go low. You humble yourself. If you have everything, you don't show it. You keep a low profile. You cannot be a child of God, a genuine servant of God. And you want to use secular branding to promote yourself. You will enter into trouble. But that is what is causing all the messes you are seeing now. So you see pastors, they are marching with politicians. They are going to government houses to collect things at the end of the day. When those government officials are stealing money, can you correct them? Can you advise them? That is it. You can't eat your cake and have it. You cannot. Which explains why a servant of God was very careful. When God's servant, Dr. Billy Graham, was alive, record history has it that he, he still he was the only U.S. president that, that was close, that had a relationship with him about seven or eight presidents. He was the only U.S. minister, U.S. evangelist. Say about eight different presidents. He ministered him personally. Every one of them, they were begging him with oil blocks. They said he turned them down. They were, what do you want? I don't want anything. Let us buy a house. I don't want a house. The same old house he lived for more than 30 years. They were showing him on Facebook. He would talk, because he was in a wheelchair. By the time he was passing away, he was, he was very sick. He was almost 90 or 90 something. He said, I don't want it. Why? To keep his voice. To make his voice to be credible. The moment you begin to collect money, collect oil blocks, you have stained your garment. You lose your credibility. That was the reason when Neymar went to Elisha. You know that story? And Elisha, ill Neymar, Neymar brought gold, brought cloth and gold. Elisha said, I don't want it. And Elisha was provoked. When Gehazi went back and said, my master just got some visitors. He said that they needed ha, the man of gold. He said, the leprosy of Neymar cling to you and your father's house. He said something that I have been saying for a long time. Elisha said, is it time to receive gifts? That's a powerful statement. He asked Giazi, is it time to receive gifts? There are some gifts that come with lepros. May they not come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. He said, is it time when the souls of men are on the line? That is not the time to be flourishing with politicians. A lot of ministers of God that God has preserved. For the last days today they have no voice because they destroy their future by the food they had today they destroy that today that god needs them when young people are looking for where to go when the world is in crisis there is what they need a prophetic direction the pastors that god has prepared for 30 40 years and god is waiting that in 2024 i will launch him out the man has already he, he had launched himself out with politicians, stained his garments, messed up his integrity. And God is looking, I need a man. I need a man. So that a church is connected to high profile people doesn't mean that it is a living church. Number seven, the church has a large followership on social media. 
no reputable church. There is nothing wrong with that. We also want one billion followers if it's possible because that will give us the opportunity to reach many people. But that is not the exclusive sign of knowing a church that's alive. The whole world can follow you to hell. <laughs> you know human beings? They clap. Hey, Jesus. They were crying to Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna. The same people who cried Hosanna, they came and said, crucify him. Beware of the praises of men. Jesus said, woe unto you when all men speak good about you. <laughs> he said this, this is in the scripture. When he, 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 they will daddy some people to hell. But when you are going astray, nobody will be able to say, sir, you are wrong. There is nothing wrong with having a land for worship. I want it all for the glory of God. But that is not the basis for choosing a church. Finally, the church is rich and prosperous. We've spoken about that one. So, Jesus was saying to the to um, John, about the church in science. Jesus said, the church is reputable. So we have looked at eight signs of reputation. There is none of these things I've mentioned that are seen in themselves, but they are not supposed to be your focus as a child of God for finding a place of worship. Satan uses these things in the last days to mislead people. Be careful. Now, <laughs> you know, many, many years ago, Many, many years ago, more than 500 years ago, I think it was in the 17th or 18th century, I can't remember this. There is a church, there was a church in Turkey. You need to go and study the history of the Turkish revival. In that, at that time, the number of Christians in Turkey were 98%, and the other people were 2%. Today, Christianity in Turkey is 2%. The other people, ninety percent, they wiped off every vestige of the Christian faith progressively. What happened? The elders and the leaders of the church in Turkey, people were warning them. They were grandstanding. We are the one that is there. We have the money. We have the property, and they began to build, and they built the most exclusive, grandiose edifice. The church was called the Church of Holy Wisdom. Google it. The Church of Holy Wisdom cost billions of dollars in today's currency. When the church was constructed, the general overseer of the church entered the church and stood like this. He said, Solomon, I have outdone you. Solomon, I have outdone you. He walked into the premises, magnificent edifice. Laid with gold. He said, Solomon, I have adorned you. Bible scholars say that the temple that Solomon built, if it were built today, would cost like 20 billion US dollars. And a man entered the temple, he said, Solomon, I have adorned you. You know what that means? That what did Solomon do in the Bible? I've done more than that. Three years after, three years to five years after, there was war in Constantinople, which is uh, the capital of Turkey today. Turkey, Turkish capital today is what? Um, Istanbul. And I won't mention the name of these people. We all know them. They can't go against the church. They entered the church premises during service, killed all the pastors, killed all the worshippers, burnt down the temple. Solomon, I have had done you. And you don't put your trust in properties and premises. These things are ephemeral. They don't last. The 20 billion dollar church of holy wisdom today has been converted to something. How much of me? Yes. <laughs> has been converted. Say, Solomon, I have adorned you. And God will laugh them. Look at this one. Because he put his trust. It's a symbol of branding. You no, know, church, church today is business. <laughs> One of my guys that does our video editing, he will come and be laughing on the phone. He said, anytime he's listening to me, he'll be laughing. He said, Pastor, you, these people don't want to hear what you are saying. <laughs> he said, faithfulness to God. He said, who cares about what you are saying? He said, you're talking about big time business. 
in the church. He said, the youth who don't listen to you, I say, who cares? I'm not preaching for them to listen to me. I'm preaching for to be a witness to them. Because God come and said, you're going to be a witness. No witnesses. Whether they hear or they don't hear, it's not my problem. But there is somebody saying it. Already commit them to jump me before God. You won't say you did not hear. You won't say I did not hear. So let's look at as we round up. What is a dead church? Jesus looked at the church in service and said, You are reputable, but you are dead. So we've looked at reputation. So what is a dead church? Jeremiah 3:15. The Bible says, Then I will give you shepherds or pastors after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. What it means, I will give you shepherds after my own heart. This, there, is, there are four words here that are very critical. It says, after my own heart. In other words, the churches or the pastors that I give my people are people who are aligned to me. They are pattern of worship. There is synergy between what they are doing and what I am doing. Jesus said, my father walks either to and I walk. So I, he said, as I hear, I judge. The son can do nothing except he hears the father. As I hear, I judge. Jesus was perfectly aligned to the Father. Not going to the north. God is going to the south. So number one, a, a dead church is a church that is not aligned with God. The ways of the leaders are directly opposite the ways of God. How do you know the ways of God? Check the Bible. How do you know the ways of God? What does God want? Somebody asked me, I said, what does God want? Check the Bible. God wants justice. God wants repentance. Don't say God wants money. Sorry, sir. He doesn't want money. He doesn't need your money. God does not need your money. He doesn't. Giving money to God is an act of service. It's an act of worship. Because in the first instance, it says silver and gold belong to me. How much you are? <laughs> so you don't grandstand and say, God wants money. This is my money. He doesn't need any one of us. So what does God want? Justice, righteousness, repentance, holiness, purity, humility, taking care of people, love. We know the values of God. So if I set up, if I start a church, and my practices are opposite those values. I am a dead judge. Yesterday, I was I watched something on YouTube, and I was provoked. Ah, my natural self, you know, as you're getting older, you get mature, you get mature. And in my language, they will say, when you're getting older, you fight battle with caution. <laughs> Ten years ago, I would have painted internet red. I said, God, this man of God went on the altar. And he was speaking on behalf of another man of God I respect in Nigeria. And he said, the grace of Papa is here today. God has raised up Papa. He was, I don't have any problem. If there is somebody here, you want to connect to the power of God on Papa. $5,000. Come in. If you are here, this man of God raised us. He was saying, I feel like entering the television and pulling him out of the altar. Before I said that, the altar was full of people. He said, 1,000 stay here. 5,000 stay here. And he said, man of God, I respect. He couldn't have done that thing without the consent of the man of God. Because it was a conference. And they brought him out to come and speak. Come and see unbelievers writing comments. Ridiculing the church. You know what happened? The video was taken down. But people had saved it. 
You now play the one that was saved. The whole place was packed with people. No one thousand stay here. And he was asking people to buy the power of God. He said, the power that changed this country, that changed, he was asking them to buy it. If you invite, you no, know, there's a man of God I love so much. I personally went to him through a recommendation from someone who is listening to me now. <laughs> and I said, sir, I want to submit you. I mean, I didn't tell him that, but because he's a very, <laughs> you have to be careful what to say, say to him. I said, I love you, sir. He brought the man of God to his church. And the man went on the altar and wanted to raise offering. He left his seat and went to the altar. I said, we don't do this here. Me, I was even ah, you could embarrass the man. I said, no. He went to the altar and took the microphone from the man. He said, we don't do it. And after he had cleared the air, he gave the microphone to say, continue your message. Don't raise offering here. So I'm sitting down somewhere. Somebody is saying, Pastor, you're here. Oh, God has given him a role of the teaching ministry. If you want to buy into this power, bring one, and I will sit down there. I'm going to share his judgment. I will go there and stop him. That is a dead church. Anywhere they are paying money to buy what Jesus died for is a dead church. Don't go there. There is a place for giving. There is a place for giving sacrificial. I believe in giving. I'm a crazy giver. But I don't buy the power of God. Any power from God that only money can trigger is from the devil. Any power, any power, supernatural power now, that it is only money that can trigger it is from the devil. A man of God told me personally, he said, somebody called in and pointed to a minister of God in Nigeria, very rich, very popular. He said, if you give this amount of money, to him for six months. What is on him will jump on you. He said, I don't want it. If what you are carrying will jump on me, if I can program, you can program power. It is as the spirit wills. You can program it. It happens in six months. Why should it be six months? That was a red flag. See, it's only Satan that promises you, give you time, give you date. God doesn't give those details. Six months time. Power. That's a transaction. The man said, I don't want a dead church preaches false gospel that is directly opposite Christ centered teachings. When you hear their teachings, you know it's from Satan. The Lord said, I should marry two wives. The Lord said, The choir leader is my second wife. The Lord said, The it is. <laughs> When you hear those things, and not as an act of mistake or a slip of thought, progressively, and it becomes a pattern. You are in a dead church. You get out of that place. A dead church, number three, is founded on satanic direction. God has no hand in it. The founder was instructed by Satan to start the church, to win the souls for the devil. There are many of them around. I don't have time to explain the details. How will you know by their fruits? When you stand there, you watch the minister. You don't need one month to know fruit. If you are deep, the Bible says the deep calls to the deep. You don't need one month to know fruit. You will know how the man relates to women. Because most of these people, one of the signposts is sexual morality. You will know. You will know. And don't join people to defend what you don't know. I can vouch for him. I don't care. Don't vouch for anybody. Love people. Trust God. But don't say, I put my life on the ground. If you know <laughs> what we are saying, don't put your life on the ground for anyone. That was say, that's somebody I respect so much that someone was telling me, he can never, I said, he has done it three times. He said, hey, I said, he has done it. That he can never do it. I said, you can't. Just, you just trust God for yourself. We are not perfect. You know that God is the grace of God is for all of us. We are building our life up. But don't be, don't, don't tell yourself to go. Only God can vouch. When God looked at Ezekiel, Ezekiel said, I have stood before you. Because hmm. when Abimelech told God, he said, In the integrity of my heart, I did. God said, Yes, I know. I know. Because God sees everything. You can't say, I know. Even in a husband and wife, <laughs> what have we not seen in this world? What have we not seen? I trust my husband, I can never do it. 
You better pray for your husband and pray for your wife. Don't build your trust on, 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 the, on the influence of emotion. Number four, a dead church uses the members to serve the personal agenda and ambition of the leader or leaders. It is a Babylonian capitalistic environment. Babylonian and capitalistic environment. You can never grow in that environment. After 30 years, you enter with 100 things, you have three after 30 years. You are in a dead church. Pack your bag and leave. They are set up primarily to grow the agenda and the empire of the founder. You can deceive yourself thinking you are serving God. After 30 years, your health is clear. A dead church promotes sin and never speaks against it. They are lovers of iniquity. Everything is fine. God does not hate divorce. Adultery is a weakness. I'm trying to manage it. You are in a dead church. Anywhere you go that they cannot with love confront sin, not with judgment, love. My brother, this is wrong. The Bible says they don't care your feeling about your feeling. Your offerings don't move them. They speak to you in love. If you are in a place where they, they rob your ego, where you are going astray, you are in a dead church. Number five, a dead church has zero or no love for people. They are caustic, acidic, adversarial, enemy conscious, attack oriented. Acidic, Caustic, any mistake you make, like they throw you in jail. Anything you do like this, they cut you off. No iota of law. Now, I have the story of a pastor who served in a church under a general overseer for like 15 to 17 years. For many years. He didn't do any job. He took his wife even away from a job and they served together faithfully. And the man, after 17 years, according to him, God, God was calling him to go and start something else. And he went, he did the right thing. He went to the leader of the church, said, Daddy. I said, okay, 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 no problem, no problem, no problem. Okay, no, it's fine. Go and, go and organize yourself, clean up the place, set everything in order before you go, and then we send another pastor. So the guy was very happy. Yeah, thank you, sir, thank you, sir. And he went to that country. And he got a call from the vice president of that ministry that he should come back to nigeria that they want to entertain him they want to do a party for him a send forth party for him and the man so and they sent somebody else to go and take over from him so he was very excited he went when he got there as he entered the office they have set up a panel putting for him he entered the panel disciplinary panel they handed him a sack letter. They did not give him one nada. They were rebel. The man wept. He said, For 17 years, I didn't steal your money. I didn't see members. I even came to home on a corner. Is it a crime to say God has called me? The man that did that thing, I see him on the TV every day preaching. I just said, like this. <laughs> see? And this man, he left. He went to one particular village, started a small walk. The man of God, who was his best friend, told me this story. He said, the man has not balanced. He said, because the damage that he had to his life, to his marriage, he said, till today, he said, man has been sick. You know, it was a heartbreak. A lot of places we call church are heartbreakers. Broken the heart of many people. And they have turned the back of many people against God. They have produced many atheists. Say, so if God is as wicked like this, let me go to Islam. This thing is shameful. And God wants us to talk about them. You can't be putting them under the carpet. Why? So that we can change. If you are in our environment and you don't know, you spend 17 years, 20 years, the day they will show you perfect, you will know. God will have been giving you signs. God is faithful. When in death, church, there are great servants of God. 
godly men of God out there, find them by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Don't lead yourself. Number six, seven. A dead church glorifies men, never gives the smallest iota of glory to God. By grace. By grace. You know what I've done to get to where I am. If you know what I've done, it is about high, me, high, my grace, my glory, my oil, my anointing, my function, me, my heart, heart, me. And it reflects in everything they do. One of these characters was walking into a church. And the host pastor, who was his son, said, look at grace on two feet. Look at grace coming in. See grace. See grace. The whole place you know. Hey, welcome grace. When did the man become grace? Jesus is God's grace personified. That was a grace and truth came through the Lord Jesus. Say, so see grace on two legs. And the man walked like this. Walking like this. You are in death, church. Number seven. A death church is a business enterprise solely established to make money, build faith, brand names. They are no business with dealing with people's lives in the first instance. They are set up to make money. A young man, as I close, who was dedicated to a man of God in Nigeria, very dedicated. He was going to see God's servants in quotes. I call him God's servants, you know, and walk towards the door of the office. As he was about to open the office, he had Papa talking on the phone. He was talking on the phone. Who cares about the will of God? I'm talking about making money here. Talking about it. He didn't hear the other side because it was on a phone call. No, it was tiptoeing like this. Who cares about the will of God? I'm talking about us making money. Daddy, he now went back. <laughs> he went back. <laughs> Who cares about the will of God? We are talking about making money here. He was talking to a friend. You know, they know what they do to make money. You are in a dead church. Don't deceive yourself. God has remnant of churches all over the place. There is no country in the world where there are no good churches. They are there. You just don't want to follow the leading of the Spirit of God. You are following the leading of your stomach or the leading of social media. If you follow God, you will find God. There are many great churches where they are following God. Find them by the leading of God. Don't choose for yourself. A dead church works in perfect harmony with corrupt people. Now, the list is endless. There is a scripture in Verse 1 to 3. I can't read this because it's a very powerful scripture. Peter was warning us, warning us. First John chapter 4, verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. This scripture did not say, Ask God to come and test the spirit for you. You test the spirit. The responsibility. For not going to citadel of darknesses or chapel of problems is in your hand. The responsibility is not in the hand of God. How you end your life is nobody else's fault. Find where there is light and go there. Do not spark your own life. You can make a mistake and spark your own light. Jeremiah 3.15 and I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Find churches that are patterned according to the heart of God. Whether they are churches of 10 million people or 10 people, irrelevant. I don't care. Find them. Find them. At the end of the day, you will be responsible. Let me stop here. Everybody will eventually end up where the people you are following will end up. Don't forget that statement. The leader you are following, where that person ends is where you end. You better be careful. Is it not wiser to follow Jesus? And they let him lead you to the right church, right ministry, right mentor, and take your eyes away from branding, money, property, crowd. If those things are there, they are additions. They should not be your primary focus. So that you can end well. 
May you enter well in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand on our feet and give thanks to God this morning. The Lord gave me this message to stir up the body of Christ and to give us the ability to understand the difference between living churches and dead churches. That a church is reputable doesn't mean it is not dead. Jesus called a reputable church, the saddest church, a dead church. Some of you are listening to me this morning. You are neck deep in chapels of darknesses and citadels of confusions. And you know it in your heart that this is not where I go because of it's my friend. My uncle is there. I was born there. And your destiny is being trampled under feet. Lift up your voice and cry to God for mercy. Many of our friends are locked up in satanic cages. Ask God to split the people and to open their eyes to show them light. Everyone who is bound in darkness, bound in, fetch, in, 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 in different cobwebs of Satan, and the devil is rubbing their nose. They are in wrong, wrong, wrong churches. Ask God to have mercy on them and save them and rescue them and deliver them. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' precious name, we are praying. You are here this morning, you do not even know Jesus. You have no relationship with him. And Jesus is stretching his hand to you this morning. This is the first place to start. Salvation. Salvation will connect you to the heart of God. And your sin nature will be deleted. And you will receive Zoe, the God's kind of life. If you're here this morning and you want to receive Jesus' free gifts, I want you to repeat these words after me. If you are sincere, say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. Come and forgive me my sins. Come and make me a new creature. Come and write my name in the book of life. I want to be born again. In Jesus' name. If you have said those words and you are very honest about them, I congratulate you. 